There are few video game finales that match up to the pulse-pounding ending sequence featured in Halo Combat Evolve's final level, The More. While it may be a revisit to the Pillar of Autumn from the beginning of the game's campaign, it offers up a very different experience, an experience which concludes with one of my favourite sequences in any Halo title. But amazing ending or not, we must still ask the question, does that quality extend to the rest of the level? Well, in this video, I'm going to try and answer that as we talk about the good and bad of the more. Before we get going proper, here's a quick rundown of what happened previously during Halo Combat Evolved. As humanity's sworn enemy the Covenant attacked the ship the Pillar of Autumn, Captain Jacob Keyes tasked Spartan Master Chief with protecting the AI Cortana, and the pair escaped to the nearby Installation 04. During the attack, Keyes was captured, but Chief soon rescues him, after which the Captain reveals the Covenant intend to use the Ringworld as a weapon, before he sends the pair to find its control room while he searches for a weapons cache. Master Chief and Cortana find a map leading to the control room, and it doesn't take long for them to reach it, at which point Cortana reveals reveals that Keyes' destination houses something horrifying. Chief attempts to stop him, but by the time he arrives, the captain's squad had already fallen foul of a terrifying new foe, the Flood. Attempting to prevent their spread, Chief and the installation's monitor 343 Guilty Spark secure the ring's activation index from Halo's library and return to the control room. In a shocking twist, it turns out the ring world can be used to stop the Flood, but does so by destroying their food source, namely all sentient life in the galaxy. Chief and Cortana won't allow that to happen, and so Guilty Spark decides they must be stopped. However, it is he who is delayed, as Master Chief destroys a trio of pulse generators needed to activate the installation. The duo instead decide to blow up the Pillar of Autumn to destroy the ring, and after securing a set of neural implants from Keys, now part of a proto-grave mind, they head to the down ship to end things once and for all. The more begins with some shots of the now-defunct Pillar of Autumn sitting atop a cliff as the fantastic track which shares its name with the level swells in the background. Some of the textures may look a tad janky in the present, but back in the day this was one of my favourite scenes in the game. At the start of Halo, the ship was drifting proudly through space. At its end, it cuts a rather forlorn figure. It really helps bring the campaign full circle. Arriving using the Banshee stolen at the end of the previous level, Master Chief barely manages to make it aboard the Autumn. This thing is falling apart! It'll hold. We're not gonna make it! We'll make it. Pull up! Pull up! You did that on purpose, didn't you? And Cortana fills you in on your objective. We need to get to the bridge. From there, we can use the captain's neural implants to initiate an overload of the ship's fusion engines. The explosion should damage enough systems below it to destroy the ring. While the Moor may share its location with Halo's first mission, the Pillar of Autumn you find yourself in is one very different to that featured at the beginning of the game. During that mission, the ship was a bustling place. Granted, most of the humans you encountered were quite busy fending off the Covenant, but it felt like somewhere full of life regardless. In the present, that is certainly not the case. While there are Covenant strike teams aboard the ship, in terms of both environment and enemies, you can almost taste the stench of death in the air. The Autumn itself is dilapidated and its halls are crawling with flood, with a far smaller contingency of Covenant and Sentinels on hand, doing their best to stop both you and the parasitic horrors which lurk around every corner. You'll recognise a lot of the ship from your earlier visit, such as the area housing the evacuation pods, the dining room and the vents, now pitch black, and the environment in its totality oozes atmosphere. During Halo Combat Evolve's latter stages, a lot of what you do mirrors to some extent at least the game's first half. In Truth and Reconciliation, you battle through a rocky environment and then a Covenant ship to rescue Keys. And in Keys, you again begin in a dark mountainous area and then fight your way through a Covenant ship to rescue the Captain. Except where in the first example you are successful, the second time around doesn't end anywhere near as well. Two Betrayals follows a similar pattern. Its objectives don't line up as beautifully as my first example, but nonetheless everything will still seem very familiar. During Assault on the Control Room, you blast your way towards Installation 04's surprise surprise control room, whereas in Two Betrayals you head in the opposite direction starting from the control room, all the while witnessing the continued spread of the flood. Your first visit to the area focused on the conflict between humans and the Covenant, while your second made it clear that the game has completely changed. The Covenant suddenly don't seem like anywhere near as much of a threat compared to the flood. 
While the horrifying discovery at the end of Keys and the battles across the darkened tundra in Two Betrayals are for me some of the best moments in Halo, the early stages of the Moor have a special place in my heart. There are so many flood in such tight spaces that they threaten at times to overwhelm, and it often feels like you're playing a more modern take on Doom as you blast your way down the autumn's winding corridors. Two Betrayals, while entertaining, perhaps went on a little longer than it should have, and indoor sections in Keys felt unfair at times, with gunfire hitting you from every angle and explosions going off all over the place. In comparison, I think the Moor strikes a good balance in terms of both chaos and length. You get 10 to 15 minutes of multi-faction madness, which I think is about enough, and you mostly fight enemies who appear directly ahead of you, other than this really entertaining encounter featuring hunters and flood on either side of you, which I love. Events never feel like they're being dragged out, and combat remains engaging, something that cannot be said for every level in Halo's second half. The game's latter stages are full of chaotic encounters, sometimes too many compared to the more considered combat against the Covenant towards its start, and I'm glad Bungie concluded things with something ever so slightly more measured. The claustrophobic indoor combat is also broken up by a short scene, during which you discover that Guilty Spark has stopped the ship's self-destruct sequence and is hunkered down in the engine room, which is where you'll need to head next if your plan is to succeed. How much firepower would you need to crack one of the engine shields? Not much. A well-placed grenade, perhaps, but why... Okay, I'm coming with you. Soon enough, you'll arrive at that very same engine room, and I've never been convinced that this next sequence is an altogether good one. Essentially, there are four exhaust manifolds which you need to retract so you can launch explosives at the Autumn's Fusion Drive Core in order to trigger a detonation, and you need to work your way through them one by one. I know that doesn't sound so bad in principle, but it can be rather annoying. First, jumping to get where you need to go while being lasered by sentinels and shot at by flood is not overly enjoyable. It's easy to get distracted by your enemies and misstep, and because the area is comprised of three levels, with your objectives on the top floor, any small mistake will often be punished by either a swift death at the hands of enemies waiting below, or at the very least, a jog back upstairs. There is, I suppose, an argument to be made that this is the final proper encounter of the game, and therefore should be the ultimate test of your ability to manage both movement and combat during a heated skirmish, but personally, I reckon there was probably a better way of doing that. Second, using grenades to get the job done can be quite tricky, as you'll see from this awful footage I recorded when I tried to do it. As an aside, I remember being able to do it with ease way back when, now not so much. You can, however, head to a nearby-ish armory to stock up on rockets and anything else you need to make life a bit easier, but this means you need to leave the area and go on a not insignificant crawl to find them. Bungie clearly knew that some players might need the assist, especially given the difficulty some less gifted gamers, like myself, might have using grenades to get the job done, so I'm not sure why the extra armaments weren't just placed somewhere within the engine room rather than miles away. As it stands, if you do need some additional firepower, you're forced to retreat and then head back, and it's all rather unnecessary. I know some are going to say, yeah, but why would rockets be kept in an engine room instead of the armory? What a ridiculous suggestion. And they'd be correct. But you're also fighting space zombies on a world shaped like a ring. Sometimes I think it's okay to go a touch off piste in the name of gameplay and pacing. Whether using grenades or rockets, soon enough it will be time to escape, after taking down a final group of Covenants, that is. And thus, we come to what is far and away the best part of the moor. Things are getting noisy down there. Everything okay? Negative, negative. We have a wildcat destabilization of the ship's fusion core. The engines must have sustained more damage than we thought. You have six minutes, or five on Legendary, to escape the Pillar of Autumn, but before I talk about the Warthog run itself, it must be acknowledged that this section doesn't really make a ton of sense. I'm pretty sure the ship itself isn't as long as the area you drive through, and in terms of geometry, it doesn't seem to serve that function or a purpose, with this teeny tiny bridge which seemingly connects the two halves of the Autumn being particularly odd. In fact, I'm pretty confident I even remember some of Bungie's team who worked on Halo Combat Evolved stating similar. Even with that being the case, I think we can let it slide given how completely and utterly entertaining it is. In design terms, it does feel somewhat like Bungie are deliberately attempting to sabotage your escape with the way the racetrack of sorts is laid out. 
Sometimes you'll have to make sharp turns to avoid grinding to a halt, and in general it can be quite tricky to navigate. I like that though, you won't see much of it in this footage, granted, but it is possible to zoom your way through most of it without needing to stop much at all once you get the hang of things, and that makes repeat playthroughs a lot more rewarding than, say, taking on the similar sequence included in Halo 3's final level, Halo. There, spaces tend to be much larger, and the brief indoor sections you go through are far easier to traverse. I'd probably give the edge to it over the Moore's Warthog run when looking at it from the perspective of someone playing the games for the first time. Speed is encouraged and you don't feel like you're constantly being tripped up, but replayability-wise, the Moore is king. There's also a short break in proceedings on the weird bridge I mentioned earlier, as Fohammer's fate is revealed. Cortana to Echo 419. Two Covenant Banshees are approaching on your six. Evade! Say again, evade! Echo 419! She's gone. Calculating alternate escape route. Ship's inventory shows one longsword fighter is still docked in Launch Bay 7. If we move now, we can make it. I've always been a big fan of the character, and I do wish she'd remained in the series a while longer. While we do have Johnson present throughout the trilogy to provide marine representation, I did like there also being another supporting character interacting with Master Chief and Cortana, who was just one of the marines. With little time remaining, the race is on to reach a longsword fighter docked nearby which can be used to flee the doomed ring, something this poor little fella probably didn't manage to do. Good thing that boom nipple's waiting for me at the starship, cause man, oh, if I worked up a big stretchy thirst! Although I'm sure he's happy enough enjoying the great food nipple in the sky. And of course, with there being a timer, it is also possible for the same to happen to you, which rewards you, so to speak, with this scene. The incredible final sequence ends with the classic sprint to a craft of some description before making a last minute escape trope so prevalent in games, films and TV, and while it is a little cheesy, it fits the section well as a whole. It is, to be fair, action movie cinema in video game form. Halo's theme kicks in, there are explosions from every direction, and you don't have to think too much about any obstacles due to the simplification in level design compared to the first half of the section. It's blooming awesome. Boarding the longsword and returning to the nothingness of space, you get a brief ending scene. Did anyone else make it? Scanning. Just dust and echoes. We're all that's left. We did what we had to do for Earth. An entire Covenant armada obliterated and the Flood. We had no choice. Halo, it's finished. No, I think we're just getting started. Before Halo Combat Evolved comes to an end. During the ending, there is also an additional scene that you'll only see if you're playing on Legendary difficulty, and it is the best Halo cutscene ever. Come here, you mother Oh, This is it, baby. Hold me. But what about the Anniversary Edition, I hear you ask? Well, I do like the opening shots of the Pillar of Autumn, which are surprisingly tastefully done. The ship's interior, however, is very much like most of the indoor areas in the rest of the game, a mess of surfaces containing way too much additional detail. This is less of an issue during the Warthog run, as the designs have more room to breathe given the size of the environment, and this is one of the few places where the excess particle effects aren't so much of an issue, as you're a lot further away from most of them than you would normally be. Coupled with the more detailed explosions, which really come into their own during the Moore's latter stages, you could argue that the Warthog run is one of the better parts of this version of the game. And Halo's destruction I think looks great too, thanks to the increased graphical horsepower the Xbox 360 afforded. There's a lot more oomph to the ring's destruction, as I think there should be. Let's be honest, when it comes to the Moore, it's the Warthog run which defines the entire experience. The level's start is very atmospheric and good fun to play, but also nothing particularly unique, and the engine room is a forgettable sequence which could and perhaps should have been so much more, especially considering it's the game's final proper bit of combat other than the few stragglers in the lift. 
If the Warthog sequence wasn't included and there had instead been more multi-faction combat, I'd have a hard time calling it anything other than average, but it does, and it's absolutely brilliant. It's so good, in fact, that Bungie even created a sequel to it to round out Halo 3, and when part of the original game is so good it's not only replicated but is given centre stage during the entire trilogy's finale, you know it must be very, very good indeed. Thanks for watching the video, boys, girls and Spartans. I really appreciate you all taking the time to watch each and every one of my videos on Halo Combat Evolved. If you had a good time, do consider liking and subscribing, and hopefully I'll catch you all again soon.